My name is Lynn Shakespeare from Central City, Iowa. I am looking for a lawyer that would represent me to take on a state hospital. And I'm making this video so lawyers can see this, hear what happened, learn more about me, and see if they can find some way of helping me. Okay, I'm gonna start this video and a timeline early in my life. Because I want you to know who I am and I want you to know what I've been through with health problems, okay? So I'm gonna start in high school. I used to be a really big guy, okay? Muscular, really huge, I could bench press 250 pounds. I used to ride motocross bikes and suddenly I started to lose weight. Everybody thought I was doing it because of the girlfriend that I had. And I lost the appetite. But was it that? I don't think so. And then they sent me, my, my parents sent me to the doctor, and the doctor said, you're losing too much weight. You're losing too much muscle. You're losing all your muscles. Okay? So I lost, I mean, a tremendous amount, and I got really sick. All right? Well, then I kept on having strange health problems. Okay, I'll just leave it at just strange without describing it at the moment. Okay, I get out of school and I was working at a job and the elevator lit loose. Yeah, a service elevator that I was pushed on a heavy cart and it, as I had a hold of this heavy cart, it went down. And I've got a hold of it, so it gave me a back and neck injury. Okay. The insurance company claimed that the back and neck injury and the neurological problems that I had were unassociated with getting hurt when the elevator let loose, and I went from the second floor and it fell down, to, you know, at least to another floor. Okay. And eventually it landed in the basement, but not with me. Okay. Anyway. So they sent me to a neurologist, and the neurologist did all these tests on me. I started having, now the shoulder that got pulled started doing this, you know, jerking, right? So that would, you would assume would be the problem of the back and neck injury. And I got tremendous sharp headaches every time I turned my head, I go, oh, 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 right? And I started getting vision problems, okay? Well, the neurologist did the probe where you stick it through the, your nerves, and he found out that my fu nerve function was very low. And then he said, oh, well, it must be simple, simple complex seizures and migraine headaches, must be. So he put me on seizure medication, but when he put me on seizure medication, I had a problem moving, functioning. Remember the nerves running through my body are, you know, signals were low. And then I went from a 32 inch waist to a 42 inch waist in a very short amount of time. And I got suicidal. I mean, I was just horrible. I couldn't hardly move. I just, it was hard for me to live, okay? Now, they sent me to the University of Iowa. The University of Iowa claimed they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. And the experience I had at the University of Iowa at that time, sure, it was bad, okay? They had me see a neurologist, and he brought a bunch of students in, and I'm standing there 100% completely nude, which I thought that was uncalled for, okay? And I continued to go to the University of Iowa to try to get help for some lengthy amount of time, and they couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. Okay. Some time goes by, I keep getting sick. I keep going to the hospital, the hospital gives me fluids. Mysteriously, I feel better. And they discharged me, and I got this humongous bill. Okay, in fact, they did that to me at the University of Iowa, too. They gave me fluids, I started feeling better, they sent me home, I started feeling better. You know, I'm, I'm right, and we could figure out why. All right, so this had been going on for a long time. Okay, now I'm gonna go quite a ways ahead into the future. We're gonna go to 2000, okay? I, okay, well, before that, I had left a security job, 
where I work, unrealistic hours of like 60 hour shift, 12 hours off, 60 hours back on. So it was wearing me down. So I left the job, okay? And I took a job at the local landfill. And somebody there, trying to be funny, sprayed my back, soaked me, with leachate from the dump. Now, if you don't know what leachate is, leachate is the, the liquid waste product that's collected in tanks. Okay, there's a sludge too. But it usually contains microbial, accelerated microbial environment with viruses you don't yet see in the public because of it, the heat and it constantly, the, the environment's constantly evolving, okay? So I got really, really sick and then I got carbon monoxide poisoning. The humidity was really high that year and some trucks pulled into the building I was in and the, the fumes overwhelmed me and we had equipment running, end loaders and skid loader and birds were dying. In fact, I was scooping birds up every day, sweeping them up, scooping them up every day that was dead, okay? I got severely sick, like a severe worst case scenario head cold. Now, just before that, I had got an infection from the dump, from something that scraped me and they, I couldn't get it cured and they sent me to a special doctor not in a hospital, not in a normal place that you would go see a doctor. It was somebody special that dump had and cured it, okay? Now, so I got an eye injury and a container that had about has this waste in it, somebody brought in, went boom, and it exploded. Could have been gas in it. We don't know, but it didn't smell like it. Anyway, the glass got in my eye, I got an eye infection. Again, I start going to the university. First off, I went to a clinic, and then they sent me to the univer uh, an, eye, an eye clinic, from a regular clinic, clinic to an eye clinic, and then the eye clinic gave me the wrong medication, and then I had left for the weekend, and by the time I got back, the infection had taken this eye. The infection had taken this eye, and I was seeing huge, like, asteroids floating around it and started getting a blackness out of part of it. When I got to the, back to the eye doctor, they realized what they had done. They had given me the wrong medication and they sent me to the University of Iowa. Now, there is the head of the department, of one of the departments, who's in the eye, you know, head of the eye department that is really good, okay? He realized what had happened. He said, they give you the wrong medication. We're going to try to save your eye. You might lose it, okay? But then, one of the people that I was seeing there, I think his name was Wagner, he said to me, he said, that, that getting that eye injury and getting that infection, that's not the, the company's fault you work for, that's an act of God. God decided that and God made you decide to get the virus. It's, it's God. And I got pissed off about that, okay? So, but we're still, that's minor. Oh, it gets much worse, okay? Well, the vertigo problem I, I, I got from that carbon monoxide and the um, real bad sinus infection, okay, which affected my ears and my, and my um, vestibular system, okay. In fact, I could feel it right back in here. Anyway, um, when I was at the eye clinic, he noticed how dizzy I was and the vertigo that wouldn't leave, okay. And the vertigo I would describe as a constant feeling of it, of it and it constantly just moves, slowly, okay? And I would have balance issues. So he decided that I needed to go see a specialist. So he sent me to the otolaryngology department, okay? Now the otolaryngology department, excuse me, told me that they just opened up this new vestibular clinic with this Dr. Fatel. Okay, and I needed to go see her and she'll decide what all I need to do, all right? First I had seen Gantz before I'd seen her and he said, well, I must have de destroyed the vestibular system, okay, if I understand correctly what he said, okay? Now, I went to see um, that new doctor, okay, 
And my mom drove me that day because the, you know, the dizziness and the vertigo was too bad. And one of the first things out of her mouth was, do you know what you need? You need somebody to ride you as hard as you can so you can't take it anymore. That'll straighten you ass out. My mom was in a room and her mouth just dropped. Elderly woman. My mom's an elderly woman. She just couldn't believe that, okay? Well, then after that, next thing she suggests is, you need Botox. I said, why do I need Botox? You need Botox because the vertigo is making your neck stiff and your, well, this way, you know, that, that neck, that injury, remember, and then, or, you know, pulling over. So then, anyway, um, so she insists that I do the Botox. So, all right, I did the Botox injection. The Botox made me sick, right off the bat. Made me feel like I had two 40-pound bags of salt on my shoulders. And she says, oh, but that's the beginning of it. Then it gets better, and then, then, you, you, then you get the real benefit from it, okay? Well, I didn't really get a real benefit from it, okay? Well, then the, um, they decided that I need a brain angiogram. I said, what? You need an exploratory brain angiogram. We don't know what's wrong with your head, but we think there's something wrong inside your head and, and we can't see it in an MRI because they, they did multiple MRIs on me before then. But we need to do the exploratory, and I I don't want an exploratory brain angiogram. Oh, no, no, no. No, you need an exploratory brain angiogram. And I kept saying, no, no, I don't want to do it. Well, now, you know, if you don't want to get that angiogram done, uh, exploratory brain angiogram done, you know, you just don't want to get any better. You don't want to get better, do you? Why don't you prove to us you want to get any better? You better agree with this because we know better. We're the doctors, right? So they eventually talked me into it. I go there for this exploratory brain angiogram. And I learned real fast I was just being used. What they did was they kept on having to try to, try to get me to sign sheets of paper that went for an organ donation. And I've never seen where they had like now, I'm going to be realistic here. It could have been five different sheets or six different sheets. Every one of them was different and worded differently. Okay? So they kept on mixing them in with paperwork and trying to get me to sign it. I said, oh, I ain't signing that. I'm not going to be an organ donor. Oh, come on. Why don't you be an organ donor? Be a good guy. Be an organ donor. I said, no, I don't want to be an organ donor. So they eventually get me into this room to do the angiogram, and I'm laying on a metal tray, nude. And they set me all up, and they got me pretty much strapped down for I can barely move my arm. They bring me some more paperwork. Here, you got to sign this before we start. I said, what's this? I don't sign anything. I told her, I said, I don't sign anything unless I can see it. Well, you don't have to read it. Just sign it. I said, no, I'm not signing anything until I see it. I said, hold it up above my eyes so I can see the thing. It was another organ donation. Shoot. You want me to sign? Another one. Totally different than all the other ones that they had shown me. And I said, you guys tried to sign me like how many of those things? And every one of them was different. Oh, she says, okay, well, we were just trying for the last time. All right. So they did the angiogram on me. And the guy was not very nice about it. They did the procedure. Quick, you know. And I realized you're, you're going to have problems. You know, I can see the colors of the dye and then... Uh, uh, I can't move, you know. And then he offers to give me a thing to bite on if I don't break the teeth, right? Well, then it didn't last that long, and he says, "All right, all right, time to time to do what we came in here for. Come on, students, come on in. We're gonna everyone's gonna practice on him, and you're gonna put in stents and shunts." Uh, who are you talking to? You. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. You're going to put stents and stunts in me? You're going to practice on me? Oh, no, oh, oh, no, no, no. I didn't agree for that. Oh, hell no. Right? Well, this doctor, the one that did the angiogram, he says, you're state property. If you would have signed that sheet of paper for organ donation, you just would have had an accident. We would have chopped you up for spare parts and nobody would have known any different. You're state property. We can do with you what we want. I said, no. So I started yelling to get out, get out of there. Well, then he, the angiogram, you know, the thing is still in me. So what he did is he grabbed a hold of it and he yanked it out like a whip. And I went, ooh. 
right through my heart. I get out of there and I tell you, I'm an absolute <coughs> shock of what happened to me. And, I'm, and I get out of there and I go, oh my God, got to get out of here. I can't believe you guys tried to kill me. Well, then one of the nurses spilled to me that I fit the profile of an organ donation list that they were looking for. The right blood type, the whole bit. Did you hear that? So they wanted to use me as an organ donor and they were going to set me up to die. And that doctor said, well, he could do it legally because I would die by an accident by that angiogram. And I would help save a whole bunch of people. So my death would have a benefit for that. Listen to that. And it gets much worse. So I start going to a general clinic, okay? After that, I had high blood pressure. Interesting, right? Probably because what they did, right? High blood pressure, okay? So they put me on high blood pressure medication. <coughs> All right, general clinic, okay? They send me back to the Stigler clinic. Okay. Now, I may have my timeline a little bit goofed up on which was first. Okay, I'll admit that. It may have been the Stibler, or the, it was the Stibler Clinic first, and then it may have been back to otolaryngology and then the, the general clinic. Okay, I might have that reversed, but it's all still there. Okay. Went back to the otolaryngology clinic, and they said, well, we got to do um, the caloric test. They're going to put water in my ears, right? That at the point it almost freezes and induce vertigo and put the goggles on. Well, I said, but I have ear tubes in my ears. That registered practitioner nurse. <laughs> no, you ain't got ear tubes in your ears. I said, well, that's weird, because I know I had them last month. No, you don't have them in there. It pushed the ear tubes inside my eardrums, leaving holes. They did the caloric test, holes in the ears. Though they said there wasn't none. The water goes inside the eardrum, inside the cochlea. It gets trapped in there. Creates the worst case vertigo, okay? Now, they couldn't understand the response they were getting. Mind you, they didn't reveal it. They poked the holes the tubes in, I have holes in my ears, and the water was going in, I couldn't figure it out. They're supposed to be third in the nation. And I couldn't figure out why everything was going wrong. They had me do that test multiple times throughout several years. Multiple, again, and again, and again, and again, and again. What happened was it induced vertigo so bad that I couldn't get rid of it that it created tornado-like episodes. And wasn't, the vertigo wasn't just doing this anymore. It was doing like a, like a spinning like this. And then all I could do is drop to the floor, help me, make it stop, and I would bark. That's what I'd do. So then they sent me to um, ear, 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 hearing test done. Every one of them, they screwed up. So you can't trust the tester. They sent me to the dizzy chair where they strap you in this tube, tape your eyes open with goggles, and then spin you really fast, change air pressure, change these lights that go around, and I barf over and over and over and over again, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong. They couldn't realize that the reason I was having such a problem is because they created it. They pushed the ear tubes in my ears and left hole and filled me full of cold, ice cold water. What they did by leaving that water in my ears started creating ear infections over and over and over, damaging my hearing in my ears. Then they sent me to another test, the tip table, okay? 
See if I can help me. The silver rehab. Look at a dot. Move your head. Look at it with your eye. Move back and forth. Look at the dot. Move at it with your eye. Look at it back and forth. And then the tip table. Okay? I go on to do the tip table. Now, most of these tests are run by young nurses or college students. I get in the room. The young girl shuts the door. I don't know if she locked it or she blocked it. But then as soon as the door was shut, I was sitting on a chair, she straddles me, puts her arms around me, starts making out, and I'm not joking to you. She says, I looks like you need a, something to cheer you up. She was offering sex. At the University of Iowa, otolaryngology, which is rated at third in the nation. Okay. Continually, I keep getting more ear infections. Each time, they, look, they say, oh, we need to, instead of giving you antibiotics, we just got to let it go naturally. Eardrum explodes. Each time, eardrums are exploding over and over and over, damaging my hearing, and each time I have less. I go back to the general clinic. You got to do Botox again. Why do I got to do Botox? Well, now, I know we've been through this before. You know, you're getting care here. You got to do the Botox. If you don't do the Botox, you don't go on to care. You can't come back here and get anything else. Okay? All right. Oh, and we got to get some drugs, too. I'm prescribing some medication to you. So they prescribe drugs, blacklisted drugs, that I think they're doctoring up because they want me to only get them through their pharmacy. Okay? And the drugs make you sick. They make you feel real strange. Okay? Now, I do the Botox. I got really sick again. Okay? I said, I am not doing that ever again. I said, I'm not doing it ever again. Oh, I got so damn sick. Right? Well, then they say, oh, well, okay. Now, we want you to join this, uh, this be a test subject. We're, we're doing a thing on tinnitus. You got tinnitus now and you got hearing loss, right? So we want it to be a test subject. We're going to, you know, uh, okay. There's going to be a benefit to you, Lynn. You're going to need to do this. Uh, okay. All right. Sure. Yeah. Okay. There they are. They're using me again. Okay. Well, then, I went through all of that. Okay. Uh, they tell me I need to go to the dental clinic. Okay. On the way to the dental clinic, my car gets sideswiped on a hit and run. I get to the dental clinic. The girl that is going to make a plate for my mouth, because I think I'm grinding my teeth with over the vertigo and the stress, she's the one that does it. She puts it in there. And I'm, I look at her, and I'm like, oh, shit, that's the one that hit my car and did a hit and run on the way here. You know? Well, she puts it in. She leaves. She runs. She takes off. Okay, this thing should only been in here for like minutes, right? That's been like more than a half hour ago. I think we're going on 45 minutes. It hardened up in my mouth. Well, by then, some students keep going by that are you know, interns that are working, you know, working there. And they go, he's been in there with that in his mouth for a long time. So they go in there and they find me. And they take screwdrivers and wedge it from the plate in my teeth to get it out. Then after the plate was made, one of the students that I had was trying to make the plate fit. He insists that I'm grinding my teeth down instead of the plate. Okay? Oh, it keeps getting worse. As time goes by, it gets more and more serious. So then, they did it to me again. Lynn, we need you to do Botox again. I said, I told you, I will never ever do that Botox again, you got me too sick. Now, you know how this is here, Lynn. You have to do the Botox, so you can't come back here and get cared. You know, you need some medication from that, from the, from the uh, pharmacy, because you know, you did that angiogram and your blood pressure went up. You know, some. So you need that, you know, you got medication. And we're not going to give you the medication. We're not going to give you the care unless you do Botox. 
So why do I need the Botox? Well, don't worry about that. You just need the Botox. I said, I don't want to do the Botox. Well, just go up to the neurologist and talk to him. They're going to discuss it with you then. So we had an appointment. I went up to the neurologist. And I said to the guys, I really don't want to do Botox. I said, if you guys think I'm having a stiff neck and stiff muscles, I said, um, just give me a muscle relaxer, you know, diazepam, something, you know. Because, you know, if you take a low dose of diazepam, you know, that, they claim that helps, you know, with the vertigo, right? Okay. No, no, no. Well, we got a special version of the Botox this time we're going to give you, a special one. I said, what's so special about it? Well, it's special. You shouldn't get sick off this one. I said, oh. Well, I was there with an ear infection, and I was on Bactra. Okay? Now, he did the injection. My head felt like it was going to explode. All of a sudden, I just got really sick. My heart started to hurt, and I could hardly walk. And he goes, oh. You ain't doing so good. I said, yeah, I don't feel good. I feel like, I feel like my head's going to explode and my heart hurts. My chest, my chest will hurt. He goes, yeah, you don't look so good. you got to get out of here. He says, you were just in here for the, the Botox injection. I don't want my other patients seeing you. You're going to scare them off. you got to get out of here. Get out of here before you, before you go down. Did you hear that? So I left hanging on to that barrier along the wall holding me up. And I wanted to go right to the ER. My mom had dro dro drove me there. And she said, no, I go to the bathroom, but I don't want to use the restroom here. And she says, and I want to drink. She says, we're going to go to McDonald's and we'll see how you're doing. So we managed to get in the vehicle. We got to the closest McDonald's. And I got out of the vehicle and I collapsed. Right on the pavement in the parking lot. People seen me. Uh, they called an ambulance. But... It didn't sound like the ambulance was going to get there quick enough. The people got me into the car, lifted me up, got me in the car. Mom drove me right to the ER. Now, according to the University of Iowa, I went into an analeptic shock, if I understand this correctly. But what happened was, for some reason, the Botox was causing my body to break down. Okay? It made my blood pressure show up to over 200. Okay, before it was like around 130 something, 135, and I thought that was too high. Okay, this was like 200 and something, right? And pink goo start, uh, oh, 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 pink goo starts coming up, and I, oh, and it, it could feel my body dissolving. No joke. So that they get me back to the room. And the pink juice just, just coming out of me so fast, I had to hold my mouth open, and it's just running out. Pink goo. You know what the pink goo is? That's me. Dissolving. They got me on a gurney, and I put a container down my head like this, and it's just running out, and I'm trying to talk, and I'm going like this. I said, oh, my God. I said, it's, it's eating the gums it's eating all my flesh so a doctor comes in and now i probably shouldn't re okay yeah i'm gonna reveal this okay that not that year but um in 2000 i became a witness for the government hiding their secrets serious issue here and the government didn't want revealed. And my mom thought, I was kind of the monitor witness, thought that they were trying to kill me because a lot of the other witnesses, in order to shut them up, died. Okay, you can ask me that in person. But I was a 9-11 pre-event witness in May of 2000 that consisted of a double agent, FBI agent, two of the future terrorists, and I had a mountain of evidence that they brought in that I was supposed to destroy and I didn't want to get involved with it and they threatened me with treason because they wouldn't follow orders, okay? You can ask me more about that later. So anyway, you can't get rid of the effect of the Botox. So the doctor 
figured out a way to try to counteract what was going on. But they figured I'd probably be dead within two hours. If I wasn't dead in two hours, the recovery was going to be very bad. I survived it. And I'm going to tell you, I went through hell. And it dissolved a lot of my gums. And bone was exposed up here because it dissolved it. Okay? Afterwards, I tried to... Now, this is the second time I've tried to get a lawyer. The first time I tried to sue them was over that angiogram, and I was told I couldn't. The second time was over this Botox injection, and every lawyer I talked to said I couldn't. And they went in afterwards, and they doctored up the records to justify getting that Botox. And then when I went to see that neurologist, they put in there... Lynn was in so much grief that he was begging for me, begging to ease his pain up by giving him that injection. That is not what I did. I said, I don't want that damn injection. <coughs> All right? And the hospital ER visit, I think they doctored that up too. In fact, I don't even know if he can find it. I had enough of them. I had to get away. I had enough. I started going to the um, free clinic. And you know what? I met so many people there with more horror stories from the University of Iowa. Went to the free clinic for a while. I ran out of money. What could I do? You know? When I first started going to the university, I started paying. And then I wound up going there. But then I wound up going there again. You know, Odal Aeronology, right? And here's what I've learned at the Odal Aeronology Department. They're using the poor, okay? They funnel the, the people on getting uh, like Medicaid or any kind of state help. They funnel them in on certain days. And the, the waiting room will be full. The hallway going two different directions will be completely full. You'll go in. You're supposed to see Dr. Gantz, okay? Or another one. And you'll see a registered practicing nurse, and then she'll, well give you a sheet of paper and send you on your way, and then it says, the results of today, you've seen Dr. Gantz and you got this problem. Everything's all pre-typed up. They just keep handing them out. Now, if they were to see everybody at least 15 to 20 minutes, there wouldn't be enough time in a day to see them all, okay? Well, I had complained about what had happened, so they told me to come back another day, and I've seen, uh, I think his name was Hampson, okay? And then he looked in my ears and he goes, Oh, I see what's going on. I see, I see your... So he goes and talks to Gantz, right? He comes back with a sheet of paper for a prescription and a booklet. And he gets real close to me and he says, Get out of here while you can. I said, What did you see? He says, I can't say. He says, I, you know, I'm not ahead. I'm somebody above me. He says, but just trust me. He says, just get out of here and don't ever come back. Don't, I didn't tell you this. Just, just get out of here. So I left. Okay. I tried to turn him in over what had happened. That, you know, doing the, saying I'd seen the doctor and I didn't, you know, and they're charging the state for it. Scamming. Okay. You're going to go after people over medical fraud, but the state wouldn't go after them. Okay. Wind up in the Insta clinic again for a while. Eventually, we're going to get some time ahead, Obamacare started. You had to either take out insurance and pay for it. If you didn't, the state provided it for you. So they stuck me on Obamacare. Okay? <coughs> Excuse me. I seen a registered practicing nurse that was absolutely horrible that got on my case. She said, you're getting state aid help. If I catch you working or making any money the other way, I'm going to turn your ass in. That's who I seen first. Okay? Then they sent me to somebody different in the Unity Point Clinic. This was a registered practicing nurse that was going to be a doctor. Very smart up on all the latest findings. She says to me, you need to, I think you need to go see the, um, an old laryngologist the PCI. Okay? Now, over all these ear infections, there was also a regular doctor that started working, that had his practice and quit it, and started working at the Insta Clinic. And he suggested it too, okay? 
And he says, you got to go there, okay? Now, I'm trying to think back. I think there was a doctor that had pointed out that I had Meniere's disease, and the University of Iowa said no. They wouldn't diagnose me with it, okay? But these two were pretty insistent. They sent me to PCI. PCI, young doctor, she just had me take a fluid pill. She said, we'll see if you do better on the fluid pill. Now, I got sick on the fluid pill, okay? And I called her, and she says, it's a fluid pill. You're not going to get sick off a damn fluid pill, okay? Well, I started getting weird bruises all over me, okay? I don't know how to explain it. I'm just telling you what happened, right? And then I called her again, and I said, I really don't feel it. It's just a fluid pill, Lynn. Just take it. Well, now one morning I got up, I said, I don't feel, I did a head dive right into a table as I was standing and about broke my neck. I came to and my mom rushed me to the hospital. The fluid pill induced tachycardia, which revealed a problem with my heart. Okay, now it's questionable if the Botox migrated to my heart. When you do the Botox, one of the first things you notice is you can't see right. When you look at a mirror and you look at it, you should not be able to see your eyes move because of the coordination. But when you take the Botox, you know, you can suddenly see it, right? And your nervous system starts misfunctioning, right? Well, so I had to start taking a heart medication, okay? Well then, go back to this, this registered practitioner nurse, and she says to me, I really think you need to go to see Dr. Risk. Dr. Risk, his dad is the one who discovered multiple sclerosis. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I you know there was a step that we missed. University of Iowa also sent me to their seizure clinic where they kept on pumping me full of drugs and then you're telling me that you're just sucking off the state. You don't want to get any better. You're just, just taking up space. Okay? All right, but that should have been way back, way back. Okay, so now, now I'm seeing this nurse, Rose Preston, nurse, and she just sent me to uh, Dr. Riss. Okay? His dad discovered mul multiple sclerosis. All right? Now, I go to see him, and he says, I don't care how long it takes. This whole day is yours, okay? He says, I'm here to help people. All right. The second visit, seeing Dr. Riss, okay? The first visit, he gave me samples of migraine drugs. I needed to help the problem. The second visit, I think the second or third visit, he says, I got you figured out. He says, I think you got a neuromuscular disease. He says, if I'm right, he says, here's how it's going to be. I'm going to send you off. You're going to get a blood test done. And we're going to see how that comes back. And if it comes back the way I think it is, and it's bad, he says, I'm not going to reveal it to you. He says, but you're going to have to go back to the University of Iowa again because that's the only place that ha is capable of dealing with this. Okay? Did the test. Went back to see Dr. Risk. He says, what did you do the day before you came into my office? I said I was tilling the garden with my little tiller. He says, your CK levels were sky high. So high that it shows that you have a neuromuscular disease. He says that I was looking at those records way back when you had your back and neck injury, and it showed that you had low nerve signals running through your body. He says that the University of Iowa did that test too, and it showed you had ner low nerve signals. and they should have looked into that more. You heard that, right? Way back then, like in 1993, right? And he said, you know, I looked at your records and I could very easily figure out that I thought you had neuromuscular disease by the same test that they had done back in the early 90s. Listen to that. That means the University of Iowa was either negligent, uneducated, or they just didn't want to help me at all. They were just using me for a cash cow to keep coming in. Went to the University of Iowa. They did that nerve probe test again. And they cracked that thing way up, and I wasn't jumping or hurting at all. 
And they said, oh my God, your nervous system is just shot. Right? Okay, next test. Muscle biopsy. Took a chunk out of my leg. Muscle biopsy showed the cell structure was wrong. Third test they did. Genetic test. Genetic test showed that I had Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. I'm one of the first people diagnosed with the sign one gene linked to it. They could have diagnosed me back in 1993. They could have diagnosed me in 2000. They could have diagnosed me in 2003. They could have diagnosed me all those years up till now. Right? And they let it go because all they were doing is using me, abusing me, mistreating me, using me as a test subject. A nurse should be responsible for what they've done. Well, let's go back again. When I was at the University of Iowa and I was doing so bad, and they wouldn't diagnose me and couldn't figure out what was wrong with me, these doctors said, Lynn, you need to go file for disability because we don't think you're going to get any better. I filed for disability. Okay? I filed for disability. But they wouldn't give me any diagnosis that I needed that really mattered. The only thing that Dr. Patel, the one that said I needed to get laid, was you have uh, benign positional vertigo. That's it. Just benign positional vertigo. Okay? But when I filed for disability, I had a lawyer from, I think it's Alsop, I think it is. I think, I don't, I don't know, it might not be it. But anyway, he's from Boston. He flew into Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And remember, I was that 9 11 pre event witness, right? Well, I had the hearing. And at the beginning of the hearing, the judge says, starts talking about this being the 9 11 pre event witness. He listened to this very closely and he says, Well, you got your hearing today. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, go back. An hour before the hearing, somebody came out and told the lawyer that he threw all the evidence in the trash. So all I had was my hearing, but no evidence. And the lawyer said, that's illegal. Okay, so I get in there, and he starts talking about 9-11. Not, talking about and the judge says, well, you were a 9-11 pre-event witness, and, you know, go, you went a, didn't go along with this. So it must have got to him, right? And he says, well, you got your hearing today, but you ain't got no case. State your name and get the f out. The lawyer was in absolute shock. Well, then a Kraus came to my rescue. All these lawyers were very serious in believing that it was the FBI, Central Intelligence Agency, the government coming after me because I was against being that 9-11 pre-event wit witness. They had to monitor me and keep me shut, my mouth shut. And I wanted to whistleblow on it, and I refused to destroy that evidence. Okay? So anyway, now, the University of Iowa. They sent me back to the neurology department. But now the neurology department, well, you know, they can't exactly say, oh, you don't have anything because Dr. Risk pointed it out. Okay? But they ain't saying that they're sorry that I went through all those years and they misdiagnosed me and mistreated me and abused me, used me, and all that other stuff, right? So they did the genetic test. I have Emory Dreyfus muscular dystrophy. They signed me up with MDA, right? But you know where this left me? Broke. I had been trying to work in 2000 after I got sick, and after I became the monitored witness. I tried to go back to work any way I could. I was driving down a road, going in and off the road, off the ditches, trying to get to a job to work because I didn't want to give up, right? I'm not lazy, but you know what? Mistreating me at the University of Iowa created a lot of trouble for me. Not diagnosing me, the negligence of that caused me a lot of trouble. I wasn't able to get my disability, sure, probably because the government got involved with it, but if they would have had everything laid out and did their job like they should have, it would have helped me. So where am I at now? I haven't paid enough into Social Security. I can never, ever, 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 ever draw it. Not enough ever to live off from. I might be lucky if I got 100 bucks, right? I can't file for disability again because the work credits are gone, all right? File for SSI, but the way the system's going right now, I filed for it, qualified for it, but can't get it. 
even if I qualified for it, which I did, can't get it. No matter how much I sold off, it don't make any difference. The government still says, we ain't going to look at it. You just don't, we just ain't going to get it. Even I qualify. So here's where I'm at. I wouldn't be in this position if it wasn't for the University of Iowa. I should get enough from those people for all those years of experimenting on me and abuse. Nightmare abuse to live off from for the rest of my life. Okay? Now here's another interesting thing. You guys give a damn about anything. Listen to this, right? I found out in 2007 when an ex-girlfriend tricked me into going to her house. I kind of find out I, she thinks this daughter is, of mine is 16 years old. Wow. Man, I really pulled at your heart, right? Do you know why she never revealed it until then? But, oh, but as soon as she did, she says to this young girl, 16, I think she's 16, she says, you want to see what your deadbeat, worthless freaking father looks like? Now get the f out, right? Well, you know why I haven't been working? Because all this at the University of Iowa did to me, making my health worse. So I got to see her for 30 seconds. Now what's that? She's in her, like, what, 30s now? I've tried my best to get in contact with them, but they don't want anything to do with me because I'm worthless. Thanks a lot, University of Iowa. Thanks a lot. So what have I been doing? I've been helping people that are sick. I've been helping my uncle. He lost his vision from an eye stroke. But yet he stayed at home. So I go to his house three days a week, go get him his groceries, take him to his doctor visits. Okay? Now in 2000, my stepdad just died, but I was taking care of him too. And I was looking out for other people to have health problems. I was doing that. I tell you what, because I know what it's like, okay? Now, I know what makes me sick now. If you have Emory Dreyfus, oh God, oh geez, you know what, I didn't tell you something. That Botox that they gave me, the Botox triggered Sjogren's disease, okay? That's where it destroys your lymphatic system. I should have said that earlier. I'm sorry, I forgot. But it destroys the lymphatic system, for I have no saliva. You know, your lymph nodes always get huge. If you live long enough with Sjogren's, you're all going to die, everyone's going to die of cancer. Okay? The Sjogren's I have because of them giving me that Botox. They gave me a disease. It's killing me. And let me tell you, the symptoms are hellish. Okay? I had perfect teeth. Rarely did I ever have a cavity. But with a dry mouth, they're all turning to cavities because of no saliva, and they're, they're crumbling and they're shattering. And then I have to do the mouthwash all the time. I have to drink. This is getting really hard for me now. I have to drink all the time, okay? Which means if I was to go back to work, right, I would have to have a job where I can constantly drink and then constantly go to the bathroom, okay? If you got the Sjogren's, the muscular dystrophy, it's getting to the point it's hard to hold it, too. So you can't hold it, you gotta go, okay? It's causing... Um, Dry, you know, the dry skin is causing uh, eye problems, which is going to lead to leading to glaucoma and all different kinds of things. Um, the Emory Dreyfus has taken the heart. The Sjogren's is breaking down my nervous system, and I don't know if the uh, in my in, in my my organs, and I don't know about the muscular dystrophy. But you know, it's not their fault that I have the muscular dystrophy, but they should have diagnosed me. Okay, but now I know I'm, I have an inability, I can't do things. For everything you do, you walk, your CK levels go up. You lift, your CK levels go up. 
you do something repetitively, your security levels go up, okay? So that's most your dystrophy. So you have to not do much, okay? That's not their fault when they start diagnosing me. <coughs> but the shoguns, the shoguns that they gave me because the Botox was going to kill me. Okay? And, you know, I need this care. Okay? I need care. Now, they forced me on Obamacare, which found out what was wrong. Okay? I had to have heart surgery once already, the heart ablation, because I almost died because of the signals. Okay? Now, that could be also be caused by that Botox, but they're blaming it on the muscular dystrophy. Okay? Now, I take uh, metoprolol, but the problem is you get the metoprolol too high since the nervous system is low. It's like taking the signal and turning it down a knob really low. What happens to a light? It starts flickering and not working right. When they get the, the amount too high, it's hard for me to get up and function and do anything. But when the heart gets erratic, I get tired and it's hard to stay awake. Okay? So, Trying to go back to work is going to be a major problem, okay? But I didn't say I wasn't willing, right? But now trying to find something that I can do and somebody wants me because they could be better, better off with somebody else, now that's a serious issue, okay? So I haven't gone back to work, okay? Now, the Obamacare they put me on allows me to get my teeth fixed, or it was, right? Well, I'm going to get vaccinations, okay? But now they're defunded it. So, I have teeth that are shattering. Dentists won't pull them down here. Other dentists won't take me. The free dental clinic refuses to take me because I have Delta Dental Insurance through the Obamacare. Okay? Which is really confusing because they won't take me because it's going to cost, if I have that, that insurance, they have to take it. But it would cost them. So my only option is to go back to the University of Iowa where I have to go back there. They do an orientation. I get on a waiting list for seven months, but now we got Trump taking office, which is the point I'm taking it away. Now, here's another issue here. Listen to this. So the University of Iowa and what they did to me, they trapped me, right? When I first started going there, it was a waiver when I was in high school. So you didn't owe anything for it. And then shortly after getting out of high school, that was so wavered, you didn't owe anything for it. Well, then they changed it to Iowa Care, okay? Iowa Care, originally on the pamphlet, said you didn't owe anything, and Grassley, he's telling all the, you know, the farmers, kids to get on it. Well, then retroactively, they changed it, and you owed for it, okay? So from that point on, every bit of care I got from them, I owe, okay? They trapped me within the system. Is it really fair that I should owe the state for what they've done to me and the state won't let me sue the hospital? No. Okay. So now they've defunded that Obamacare, which it's, uh, I don't know, I don't know what the health care insurance is they have, but it's through that Obamacare in the marketplace. Okay. But they've defunded it. So I can't get the dental care no more. I can't get anything, most, a lot of the care I need, I can't get. Uh, I have to see a heart doctor or I'm going to die. I have to see a dentist or because the teeth keep crumbling because of the dry mouth. I can't get the care I need. And far as it goes for the Shrogans, you know, I should be getting something of a care for that and that muscular dystrophy, but I'm having a problem with them defunding that. Now, I have asked the University of Iowa to give me a referral when it could, and for I could go to some place in Cedar Rapids. And they treated me like I was UIHC property. So I eventually quit going. All right? What do you think happened? That was like in 21, so you got 21, 22, so you got 22, 23, 24, right? This is this year. What happened is I get a letter in the mail from the CDC wanting to know how my conditions have progressed. And if I tell them, they'll give me 20 bucks. I was a lab rat for the University of Iowa for the CDC all along. And if you say I wasn't, 
Why did the CDC, why does the CDC, CDC have an interest in me <coughs> to know how my conditions have evolved? I have no way of surviving. I'm living with my mom, but you can't take care of yourself. And take care of her, take care of her just like I was taking care of her brother that went blind. Okay? And I was helping some other people around here too, but you know what? They eventually, they passed away. I don't have no income coming in. Okay? Now, I will say this. You look me up. You do some interesting things background checks on me, and you're going to find something very interesting. After becoming that witness for the government, I was ripped off by somebody you know as Mark Zuckerberg. I had a friend that got paralyzed with spinal meningitis, and I created the intellectual work to create a social kite called My Journey. Join me on my journey, and I'll join you on yours. A social site that helps support free clinics, shelters, and a cure for neuromuscular diseases. Join us on our journey to help others, to make the world a better place. I let Mark Zuckerberg stay at my home. I offered him, or I asked him to help me with the coding, because he was a friend of one of my friends that was in the same hacking club. Mark offered to help me, he found me investors, but then this lawyer, Mark Howitson, got involved. Mark wanted to know if he could use my intellectual work and pay me a return where I didn't have the stress of running it. And we eventually worked out an agreement that we all agreed to. It was recorded by video by his new CD camera, CD, Sony CD camera, 2003. A mini, uh, mini cassette recorded audio, Advantage camera, digital camera, handwritten. After everything was all done, Mark asked me to give him the rights to my intellectual work and I refused. He threw a fit, ripped open the Advantage camera, um, formatted my digital camera, took the, the mini cassette, dumped it in pop so it all stuck together, and he went to get a copy of the CD. On the last day, he stole all my intellectual work and he ran like a bat out of hell. He was here with the school bus because he was going to live at it at the, in a, at the University of Iowa. They call it a schoolie and then sell it afterwards. He was here with that bus gathering parts. Okay, That was when the government finally eased up on me so I could have be around people because before then I couldn't be around nobody. So don't ever, ever tell me I didn't ever amount to anything because I created that intellectual work. And then in 2006, when they had the hearings for Facebook's battle, Zuckerberg and Howardson called me demanding that I give a statement backing up that Mark got the work given to him, and he took it to back to Harvard and bragged that he had it given to him. He said, looky, somebody gave me the plans for a billion-dollar Internet site and more. And then I refused. They had a goal to say, oh, everybody wants you to to uh, give a statement that you want him to create a new creation history too because you want to hide as the author. And then they threatened me to come forward and after they did, they created a new creation history hiding me and that's how I got screwed. Okay? But don't ever tell me I never amounted to anything or was going to amount to anything. I was also offered a position of security advisor in South Korea when I did security and I turned it down because I was more important for me to get that internet site going to help my paralyzed friend. Want to hear more? I was designing things. The first thing I designed was in 1984. But I didn't try to get a patent on it until the early 90s. Went through that event network. It was a solar lantern. But there was such a high bill I accumulated from the event network that they wrote off my bill for they could keep my patent, okay, the intellectual work, and a patent. And it was sold to the United States government. You ever see the solar lights that they got a rope that goes through them? 
They could chain them all together, they're floating in the ocean, and they got a hole in the bottom of it, put a pole in, just stick it in the ground and a magnet so it'll collect the metal. That was me that designed that. Want to hear of another one? Do you remember multi tools they came out? It was Klein Tools from Cedar Rapids, Iowa that designed those, right? But it was a flop. The thing flopped around. It was a piece of crap. You had to hold it between your fingers. I was the one that told them how to put two different tile springs in it. Drill two holes in it, put a pen spring in the back, or cut a circle in the middle of it, and put a spring type clamp in it. Hose clamp. With two points going off the directions that worked as a spring. And reorient or reorient the tools. That was me. 2011. Check your history. I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. My, my time and what's getting, you know, what's going to happen to me and I'm running out of options. I'm writing a book to expose everything that's happened to me over all these years. Because when I was involved with 9-11, there were some people that, lawyers separately and famous people, that started a committee that wanted the truth. And one of them, which I won't reveal the name, because he wanted to remain anonymous, was an actor that he died. But before he died, he asked me to write that book and expose everything that happened. And he says, I want you to write about your entire life. He said, it's so interesting. I want you to write about all the struggles you've went through and all the things you've done about your entire life. So I'm trying to write, that might be money coming in if I ever get it done. Okay, well, of course I'm probably going to get sued, you know. But I need help. I really do. You're watching this, and you're an attorney, and you can get off your ass and help me. The Department of Justice, I've done videos for them over and over and over, and they could have helped me, and they never did. Over Mark. If you're a lawyer out there and you have the options, you can do something. Help me. Help me. Figure out a way to go after that state-run hospital. I should be not be left with nothing.